Well, I have the joy this morning of introducing a guest speaker who really is more like an extended family member. Um, Billy Reyes has preached here before, and he is a gift to our church, and he's a gift for a particular reason. Uh, Billy is a senior pastor of our sister church in Midland, Texas, so he's got a drive ahead of him later today. Uh, but he wanted to stay after the youth retreat to serve us as a church, and I invited him to see if he'd be willing, and he was always, as he always is, exuberantly willing to serve us. Uh, and I wanted to highlight one particular reason I'm grateful for Billy. I, I was talking to a friend um, yesterday at the retreat about a an acquaintance that, that they have of a pastor, and not in our family of churches, but in a different situation. And they were just talking about uh, how hard it is when, when, when a pastor goes through a difficult time, and it's difficult to know who who pastors the pastor, who who cares for the pastor when they're going through a difficult time or there's a difficult church season and so forth. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm so grateful for Billy is that in, in our region of churches, in our family, um, that's just an obvious answer. Um, Billy loves pastoring pastors. He loves caring for pastors. He loves encouraging pastors. He loves making sure that pastors are sufficiently joyful and not depressed or worried or anxious. He loves doing everything he can to make sure pastors are happy. And that means that those pastors find it easier to pastor other people. So even though a lot of members of our church don't get a lot of face time with Billy, uh, they're being uh, blessed because of what he's doing to encourage and equip and serve and comfort and be available to your pastors and to the other pastors in the region. That, that really is a gift to every member of our region of churches. Um, and Billy is eminently suited to love other people. He is a loving man. And... For all of those reasons, I wanted to ask you if you would thank him and also welcome him as he comes to preach to us. Good morning, everybody. It is so, so good to see you uh, this morning. And like John said, this weekend was... Just God was so faithful. When he, those of you who were there, so faithful and gracious. And I want to just address the young people today that were at the, the retreat. You know, just the word proud is a weird word in, in Christianity because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it in, in the terms of being proud for self-accomplishment, but kind of like fatherly, <laughs> you know, how, how a dad would say, I am just so proud of you. Uh, for leaning into God. It was, it was so fun to just watch. You know, sometimes, you know, I just like to just kind of watch a little bit about what God is doing. And just your faces and the way you served and the way you cared for each other. Um, that's, it was just so awesome. And the way you wanted to take it beyond the retreat. That's the, that's the key of a good encounter with God is you want to take it beyond that time and share that gospel witness and love to other people. So I couldn't be more thrilled, you know, in loving you guys and caring for you. And I can't wait to see what the future holds as you continue to seek God's face and serve the Lord. Um, thank you, buddy. I sure appreciate that. To all the ladies, my wife sends her greetings. Uh, Jan had the joy of being with you uh, not too long ago. I know time kind of flies, but she just regretted not being able to come. Our oldest is getting married in August, and we're so excited about that. We, we're one of the, we're an all-boy family, so my son sees August 7th as his wedding date. I see it as a due date, because I'm getting a daughter, and I just am in love with that thought, um, and so Jan had to work Thursday and Friday. I left Thursday to come to the retreat, and so it just didn't, just didn't work well for her to come, but she sends her love. Uh, it was, you know, she came down to try to encourage and, and serve, but you blessed her. She came home so refreshed, so encouraged about uh, the work of God, not just here, but, you know, sometimes when you're with people, they help you see what God is doing in your own world better, and you, you so helped her in that regard. So that was just so fun. One other thought about the youth retreat. Are the sermons going to be online? They are going to be online. Um, <laughs> most of them. <laughs> um, 
You know, have you preached the sermon you preached here before? Or at the retreat, you haven't preached it here yet? Um, either do that, or please tune in to all the sermons. I mean, they were, they were just uniquely timed and fitted together and given by God. But John taught Saturday night, um, Saturday night, Friday night, Friday night. And I went to him afterwards and I said, I think I got saved again. I mean, it was just, it was one of those messages that were just so, oh yeah, what a great savior. What would Spurgeon say? I have a great need for Christ and I have a great Christ for my need, you know, and it was just one of those timely messages that I think would be super, super encouraging uh, to you. So guys, thanks for being with, letting me be here with you guys this weekend. Such a joy. If you're visiting today, um, I could not recommend these pastors more to you. Um, and if you're looking for a home church, that's a major decision, isn't it? And, and, you know, I just try to encourage people in Midland, you know, as, the, as you're looking for a home church, there are some certain, like, benchmarks that I'm hoping that you're, you're looking for. Um, Gospel-centeredness, obviously. Um, sound doctrine being preached. The scriptures being carefully presented and exposited. Seeking to, to know what God's heart and, and it was in inspiring them, not trying to make them say what we want them to say. But a huge component of that is leadership. Pastors are, are called to represent a, a shepherd-hearted Savior. And it's so important. It's just so important, not only for your own soul, but if you're a parent. I, I get so excited that my boys have grown up being able to look at men of God and that model Jesus for them. And th that's the pastors you have here. Um, so I couldn't recommend the church more highly. Um, so... Welcome, everybody. Would you open your Bibles this morning uh, to Romans chapter 8? We're going to look at a very familiar passage, but I'm going to also extend it into chapter 9, which um, I don't know that, that maybe we've done enough of. Romans chapter 9 is an amazing chapter, very theological, uh, very much about God's sovereignty, but I think, unfortunately, we've disconnected a little bit of Romans 8 and a, a, an intended flow that God wanted to accomplish so that we might better understand the first few verses of chapter 9. So as you're, as you're turning there, you know, the message this morning is called Sovereignty, Security, and Sacrifice. And I hope you'll just kind of see that jump out at you from reading the text. Um, but as, like I said, as you're turning there, my dad, I love my dad so much, um, when I was young, if, I, if my dad ever heard me cough, if my dad ever heard congestion, you know, in me, man, here comes the vitamin C. I don't know if you had, you know, a parent like that, or maybe you're a parent like that. I have certainly have done that with my boys. Um, in fact, I think dad thought vitamin C was a cure-all for everything, right? Any kind of weakness, take vitamin C. So if I, if I brought home a bad grade, have you been taking your vitamin C lately? <laughs> Uh, I was a baseball player for a while, and, and if I was in a batting slump, son, are you taking your vitamin C for that batting slump? And um, I'm learning. I'm learning to take the principle that my dad had of, of, of taking vitamin C at the sign of weakness, but I'm learning to apply that to my prayer life and my Bible study life. Um, here's the difference. The difference is whenever I experience a bout of unbelief, so that's a weakness, isn't it? You may be here with that, struggling some, with some belief this morning. Whenever I feel like I'm not breathing very well, I'm congested at the thought of, a, of the future direction of our nation. Does that ever kind of take your breath away a little bit? Um, the moral decline that we're facing? I don't increase my vitamin C. Instead, in my Bible study and prayer, I, I'm trying to have a diet rich in the sovereignty of God. That's what I want to communicate to you guys. As, as we move into the summer, and there's going to be the Democratic Convention, the Republican Convention, and then November with the election, and, the, and just what's happening in world affairs, and what's happening in gender issues, and all of those things, I want to encourage you would you increase in your diet 
a study of the sovereignty of God. I think our souls need it, but let's talk about why this morning. Okay, why do our souls need that? And I, I think when we're talking about God's sovereignty, we can think mainly in terms of power. So even just using the word sovereignty this morning, you might just kind of think that God just, he's, he's certainly all powerful, I believe that. He can work all things together for the good. We're going to read that this morning. But I, I think sometimes there's a disconnect when we think of God's sovereignty, somehow we, we remove it from intimacy. Guys, God intends to, re, to, to express his sovereignty to us in a very personal way, not just a powerful way. And how I hope that your heart will be blessed with that intimate sovereignty of God this morning. So, would you join me in uh, reading the text this morning, starting in Romans 8. And we're going to go verses 28 into chapter 9 um, and verse 3 of chapter 9. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. I, didn't, I don't think I gave that the emphasis. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us right this moment. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Oh, Lord, how great thou art. Lord, I, pr I pray that our souls would sing that even as we study your, your word today. Lord, would, would you just lift up every countenance this morning, lift up our eyes to behold not just a powerful, sovereign God, but a personal, sovereign God. And Lord, we pray that so your sovereignty and the security it affords to your people, God, we pray that it would have the effect that you intend security to have in the heart of a believer, that we could be living sacrifices for your glory and gospel witness, both locally and globally. We ask these things this morning for your honor, Lord, and for the joy of these precious people. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. $5 question. 
How secure are you this morning? How secure are you this morning? If we look at our culture and our media, it would seem that security is something that all of us want. All of us seem to know we need security. And it's something we must not often feel we have enough of, because in the United States, it seems like someone is always trying to sell you some form of security. I think about once every couple of months, there's a knock on my door. I don't know if this happens here in Round Rock, but in my neighborhood, this happens regularly. Knock on my door, and it's from the same home security company. I don't know if you get, get visited by the home security people. Now, you need to know, in front of my house, there is a pretty big sign that says, this house has a home security system, right? And yet, this guy comes knocking at my door every couple of months. Same guy, so I'm starting to build a relationship with him. And on about his third visit to my home, I finally, it's like it dawns on me what he's trying to do. And I just even told him, I said, dude, you are trying to make me feel insecure about my security, right? That was his goal. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, that's not an isolated example. Investment companies try to point out how insecure our financial security is. Politicians like to point out how insecure our national security is so that you'll get, uh, give them your vote. So let me ask you this morning, just, just as a friend, where are, you, where are you feeling vulnerable today? Where are you needing, where are you aware of, of a need for more security? Is it in your parenting? Parenting is such a wonderful, but it's a challenge, isn't it? It's a wonderful challenge. Maybe your marriage. Maybe there's something going on in your marriage. You're feeling a little bit vulnerable in your marriage. Complications in your health. That's always a big one for us in regard to considering the future. How about this? Maybe some of you have made mistakes or, or, or you've sinned or there's been failures. And, and it's made you vulnerable to wanting to try again. Maybe, maybe there's been something that's happened that you've, been, you've, just, you've just felt vulnerable. I don't like what I felt on that past failure. I don't like how it hurt me. And so you've kind of built a, maybe a little bit of wall to instead of reach out and try ministering again. You need to, listen, God's calling you. Come on, minister again. But you're just... I, I just don't have the security to do that. I don't have the security maybe to apply for the new job if I was let, let go, I was released. Are you facing a decision in your life? And the uncertainty of that decision is just making you feel right now very vulnerable. I'm sorry for all the questions. I've got a big nose for a reason. I, you know, my family's Arabic, so I've, I've got the Arabic thing going on. I'm sorry, I'm butting my nose into your life. But... But I guess in some ways, I'm sort of like the home security salesman. Man, I hate to even say that, but, but maybe it's okay sometimes to maybe highlight where there's some real insecurity about your security. Uh, I'm not trying to help sell you home security today, right? I look like a salesman probably, but um, I, I'm not trying to sell you home security, but I am so concerned about your heart's security this morning. So let me turn the corner and ask one more question, then I'll quit asking questions. What's the purpose of security? I think that's a huge question to think about in our culture. Is security intended to minimize our sacrifices and maximize our safety? Is that, is that the goal of security? No, it's not bad, but is that the goal that God has for security? Do I want security so that it eliminates the need to live by faith? Have you ever done that? I mean, sometimes I try to so structure my life, and I think the Lord's trying to show me, Billy, you're trying to put yourself in so much control, and the, the reason is you don't want to live by faith. Do I want security to do that? Well, I'm hoping that Romans this morning can provide our hearts with sacred security. Um, but be advised in advance. The security that God gives us is not intended to be spent on a life of earthly comfort, okay? So are you with me there? So I'm, I'm giving you that in advance. That's how we're going to end this morning. And now maybe you're even kind of thinking, oh, that's why he went into Romans 9. 
because there's some major statements about a heart willing to make sacrifices in those few verses. So I, I, listen, so know in advance that God is not wanting us to just spend the security he gives us, wonderful security, but it's not just to be spent on earthly comfort. God wants to give us sacred security to free us from a life devoted to earthly comfort. He, he wants to give us the security to give us freedom and joy and courage to move sacrificially to the hard work of loving people and to move sacrificially maybe even toward those who have hurt you. And so our main point this morning is this. Well, it's too long. You can tell that John and Aaron went to the PC. You can tell I've never been to Bible school. So my, my main points are like 40,000 words long. But anyway, so I'm sorry. But here's the best shot I got at it. God's sovereign love gives us radical security so that we can make radical sacrifices in loving others for the sake of the gospel. So, was that up? Did you already? Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Pray for the guy doing the PowerPoint. Not because he's, because he's working with me. That's why I need to pray for him. So, here's the first point that I see, think we'll see this in Romans 8, 28 through 34. God's sovereign love is the source of our security. And, and you see it. This section of Romans, I, I think, is meant... To, to give you this sense that I have unshakable security in him who loves me. I have unshakable security. And that security is, to, is there for two reasons. One, to sustain us in the very real sufferings of life. But it's also there to compel our sacrifices in our mission to make disciples. So, but before we can get enjoy the blessing of these verses, I think two issues jump off the page, and um, they are they're these. These promises, did you notice in verse 28, there's, there's a focused point of who these promises are, or for. And they're for those who love God. They're for those who are called according to his purpose. For the younger folks, listen, you're living in a world that's, that's a lot of cosmic mumbo-jumbo. You're, you're living in a world that's, very, that's open to spirituality. And there's this, this view that, well, all things work out, right? You'll hear, you'll hear atheists say somehow, all things work out. Can I tell you something? All things don't work together for the good for those who don't know Christ. There is coming a day when they will have to stand before the Lord and give an account for their breaking God's commandments, and even worse, rejecting God's Son who died to pay the price for their broken commandments. I don't think that that's very good for them, do you? So all things don't work together for the good for those who don't love Christ. So I think that we need to kind of pause, hit the pause button just for a minute and say this this morning. Do you love God? And I'm not talking about like generic love. I, I, I'm talking about center your life around someone love. I'm, and that's not no matter what I'm talking about. I think that's what the text is talking about. Maybe here's another way to put it. Is God your treasure? Now, please, I'm not saying perfectly. None of us have God perfectly as our treasure. But, but is he the, the abundance of your heart? When you have discretionary time, do your thoughts kind of ultimately go toward him? You think about the one you love. You think about, uh, about how to, to honor the one you love. And then Paul says, about the, not, not just do you love God, have you been called by God? Not as a pastor and not as a missionary. It's, it's more that intimate call of God. That he, Paul defines it ultimately, those whom he called, he justified. So essentially, he attaches those two words together to say they're saved. You've heard God's call in this drawing way. Before your heart, listen, I, I can't all of us remember at some point when you were just bored with Jesus? 
your parents drug you to church and you're going, I have no idea. I'm sitting next to this guy. He's lifting up his hands. Tears are rolling down his cheeks. I can't wait for the start of the football game. What are we doing here? And then something happens that you're hearing about Christ crucified and that he literally was being treated as though he committed the very sinful acts you did even seconds ago. He's being hung on the cross and being treated like he was bored with God because he's being punished for your boredom with the God of glory. And for whatever reason, in God's sovereign mercy and grace, your heart is made tender. You, you, you hear it's like someone is calling you, and it's not the big mouth preacher from Midland, right? It's, it's the voice of love calling you, saying that he cherishes you. He wants to save you. He wants to make you his own. He wants to be your perfect father. And you lift up your heart and you say, God, I'm a sinner and I need you. I want to follow you. Please give me your spirit. Let me be your child, right? Isn't that the, that's the call that Paul's talking about here. Have you been called? Because if you've been called, you'll love he first loved you so that we would love him. He gives us the grace to love him. And, and so I really wanted to just hover for a, just a moment there because if, if you're visiting with us today, I, I think those, those, those are benchmark things. Please don't go just rush by that. Are you bored with God? 23 hours and 59 minutes of each day. Do you know his love? i tell you, if you'd want to know more about the love of God, come talk to John and Aaron after the service. And they would love to introduce you to Jesus and the, and the plan that he offers all of those who would turn from their sin and trust him as their Lord and Savior. Well, let's go a little further because he, got, he starts listing out all of these, these sacred heart security issues that those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose uh, receive. So here we go. I, I took a while there, so now we're going to start moving this train down the tracks a little more quickly. <laughs> so verse 28 says, God causes all things to work together for the good for those who love him. Doesn't that give your heart security? Isn't that so good to know that, that your mistakes have not become sovereign? But we believe that sometimes, don't we? If you're a parent, that happens a lot in parenting. Am I doing more damage to my kids than I'm helping them? I mean, it's just, isn't it so good to know that even in my foibles as a dad, God is still loving my sons and working things together for their good. Verse 29, it describes what good means. Does that mean good is a pain-free life? No. Verse 29 describes really good is being conformed to the image of Christ. So sometimes I complain about, God, I, I don't know how this is good. You know, you're working all things together for the good. I'm still behind on my bills. I still have this health issue. I still have this. And God's saying, listen, my idea of your idea of good and your idea of good don't always match. My idea of good is you becoming more like my son. You're knowing my son. You're loving my son. Verse 29 says that God sets his love on you before you were born. That's very much like the word that came this morning. He loved you before you were born. He foreknew you. He knew every sinful and evil thing you would ever do. And he loves you anyway. I love the story of the woman at the well. And after she meets Jesus and is, it encounters his sovereign love, she goes back. Remember, she goes back to her village and she starts telling people, you you got to come meet this guy because I have met someone who knows everything about me. Remember her past? Remember her life? Life of adultery and harlotry and just all a very sad, wounded, sin-stained life. And she says, come meet a man who knows all about me and he loves me still. 
Oh, that's good security, isn't it? He set his love on you before you were born. He, in verse 30, we, he called you. We saw that. In verse 30, he says, those he called, he justified. So that means that through Christ's sinless life and his sacrificial death on the cross, God then can count you as righteous and forgiven and adopted as his child through faith in Jesus. Verse 30 goes on to say that all those that God saves, God will glorify. So in other words, God will be with you not only in today's trials, but if he loved you before you were born, if he gave you grace to hear his voice calling you, if he saved you, if he's justified you, then he will finish the work he began. And now you're starting to get this panorama of the work he began. Sometimes I think that the work God began in me happened when I was born on September 29, 1959, 10,000 years ago, right? <laughs> no, God's work began, I don't know. How do you describe that? When was I on God's, first on God's mind? God knows no beginning and no end. So he, he finishes the work. He begins. He loves me in advance. And he promises that for all eternity future, I will be in his presence. Can you say security? That is sacred security, isn't it? It's almost like a spiritual Oreo. So stupid. My examples are so dumb. If my sons were sitting here, my sons would be going, Dad, you ju Dad, have you thought about selling camels for a living instead of pre... Anyway, um, but I mean, think about that. An Oreo. This is so terrible. But anyway, <laughs> let's may as well finish the stupid illustration. But, but you're surrounded, right? This side... Eternity past, right in the middle, the cross of Jesus, and on this side, eternity future. Why do we worry? Why do we fret, right? What sacred security. Um, verse 31 goes on to say, so if God is for you, who can be against you? Right? So now you see where that flows out from. It's a good memory verse. But if you're not kind of seeing the verses that flow into it, you're, you kind of lose the impact of that verse. Verse 32 says that since God gave his son for you, since God delivered his son to death for you, then he's going to give you everything else you need. To me, that's a life verse. I'm going to invite you to make it a life verse. If he loved me so much to take care of my biggest problem, and that was his justice that I deserved, his judgment, his righteous judgment for my sins was my biggest problem. And if he solved my biggest problem, then all these other real problems, he will give me everything I need, right? So it's still rooted at the cross. See, we know he's going to help me with these issues. Why? Because he gives me the cross. He gives me the sun hanging on a cross. He gives me the resurrection three days later so that I can know without a shadow of a doubt that he's going to provide what I need today. Um, so he goes a little further, and he says, the one that justifies, he says, listen, can, can any charge, can anyone give a charge against God's elect? Can any charge stick against you in the courtroom of heaven? And the answer obviously is no. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? No one, because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who love Christ, right? So here's a little point. Maybe, you're, maybe your insecurity this morning is more of an internal insecurity, right? You're, you're, you put a smile on the outside, but inside there are things that you're ashamed about in your life. It's hurting you. There may be, you, may be a, you may be a quiet worrier. You may be smiling, but inside you're afraid. All of these elements that God is saying is nothing on the inside of you will ever separate you from God's love because Jesus paid it all. So he takes care of the internal insecurities, but that's not the only thing that he takes care of. 
he finishes by saying that Jesus is even now at the right hand of God interceding for us. He's praying for us similarly like he prayed for Peter. Remember when he said, Peter, man, Satan's wanting to bring you through the ringer, but I've prayed for you. And you know what happens when I pray for people? Even though you're feeling like your faith will fail, he tells Peter, your faith won't, won't fail because I'm praying for you. I'm sustaining your faith. And that's sacred security, precious ones. And we go into the second point. Now, why is that going to be important? And that's the second and third points. God wants to give this wonderful security in his sovereign love because it does sustain us in suffering. So in verses 35 through 39, in this section of Romans 8, Paul gets really real about pain and suffering. No rose-colored glasses here. No, no confessing it is going to take away my suffering. He picks the most frightening and painful things that a human can experience. And he wants you to have so much security in his all-conquering love that even these seven kinds of suffering, even in them, ultimately, though you may wonder at times, though you may feel uh, like you can't touch the bottom in the swimming pool of your life at times, you still don't curse him. You're still not forsaking him. You're still trusting him. You're still holding fast to him. You're still finding yourself being satisfied by him, even if everything else is being taken away. I mean, some of you guys have really known deep suffering whether it's been you've been rejected by a family member. Maybe, maybe your spouse was adulterous. Maybe you, I'm, I'm, and I hate these, I hate giving these examples. So I'm not trying to, un, to, to kind of peel off a scab. Please forgive that. But you might have been abused by a family member growing up. I, I hate these, these, oh, these illustrations. I hate these things. But isn't it amazing that if you're a Christian, in spite of all these things, you still find that, that God has put like almost a life preserver in your soul. That even though all these things have happened to me, I still love Jesus. I mean, that's, that's what God wants to do in the midst of suffering and pain. And precious ones, that's a witness that will change the world. Man, people, can you get, go, they go into debt to buy new cars. They go into debt to buy houses that are too big for themselves. So, at least I'm not pounding going into debt for those things. I'm just saying it's easy to give an appearance of prosperity when there's an emptiness of soul. It's just so easy. And people want to say, well, wow, maybe that's successful Christianity, that you've got all these things going for you in the midst of this broken world. Maybe if that's the Jesus that you're following, man, maybe talk to me about him. And, and our Savior's one who hung on a cross. Those who follow him, we're going to see, they're, they're, they're ones that face persecution and tribulation and distress. He doesn't take the problems away. He doesn't, he, he, this Christianity is not, well, let me, let me put it. Let, here, whenever you stumble for words, let John Piper talk. So here's, here's a quote from Piper. The massive power and wisdom and love of God for his people does not promise escape from these things. The power and love and wisdom of God promises triumph in these things. And part of the triumph is that you love Jesus even if everything else has fallen apart. People in this world don't know what that's like. And man, when, when we go through hard times and they see a faith that's being sustained by a loving, sovereign, personal, intimate God, it shines like a light in the darkness. They may have prosperity, but they're drawn to the, your faith in the suffering that you're going through because they're seeing the hands of God lovingly caring for you. Verse 35 really summarizes verses 28 through 34. He says, so who can separate us from the love of Christ? So here we go. Shall tribulation, any pressure you're facing today, any trouble. So now you're seeing nothing on the inside can separate me and nothing on the outside can separate me from the love of God. How about distress? 
Are you going through a stressful time? Any crisis, anything dangerous going on in your life? Persecution, any op opposition, any ridicule, any active form of opposition from the enemies of the gospel? Famine, suffering, scarcity. You might be going through some, some scarcity in your life right now. Nakedness. It's not just like clothing. Are you, are you dealing with some embarrassment and some shame and you just can't find enough clothes to wear that will cover it. How about peril, any danger or threat, sword, any injury, any violence, any death? Paul goes into 36 and he says, and he's quoting Psalms, and he says, as it is written, for your sake we're being killed all day long. We're as regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Guys, Christianity in the United States is not the normal experience of Christianity around the world. And somehow I guess we think it is. In North Korea, Pakistan, Sudan, I, I loved coming in here today and I'm seeing all these flags. I asked Aaron, did you guys hang up all these flags? That's a lot of work every Sunday. You're hanging up all these flags. This is awesome. And they were already here. Don't, don't just get used to them. Think about your, your brethren in the nations. Think about God's call and plan to reach every tribe, race, tongue, and nation for his glory. But we have precious family members in the faith who are being considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Did you know an estimated 100,000 Christians are going to die this year? 100,000 Christians. That's 273 a day. That's 11 every hour. Our blessed experience of safety in the United States is a blessing to be sure, relative safety, but it's not the norm in the world. It's not been the norm in Christian history. But shall any of that separate us from the love of Christ? Paul says, no way. Satan might say, way. Paul says, no way, right? <laughs> so in verse 37, and all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not only can we be not separated from the love of Christ, but that love, that in that love, he gives grace to turn every trial into a triumph. So we're more than conquerors in him who loved us. Now you may say this morning, I don't feel more like more than a conqueror. And I'm glad to be honest, I, I, <laughs> that's my experience pretty regularly. I don't always feel like more than a conqueror. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? Well, it means that you have sustaining faith in the midst of trial and pain. It means that in spite of those who have so horribly treated you, you find this compelling love to forgive them, even as you've been forgiven by the Lord. Precious ones, that is being more than a conqueror through him who loved us. So be encouraged. I'm coming to the conclusion. <laughs> okay. um, but is that the goal of security? Is the goal of security security? That's a, a way to ask it, right? Is the goal of security, security? No. The Bible, the love of God for us, is the root of our love for others. The reality of the sovereign love of God for us is what compels our sacrifice for others. Here's another way to put it. God's sovereign love for us compels sacrificial love. I mean, you can see how, can't you see how that would make you very bold? Your sin is not holding you back. Your internal struggles, your fears, or your worries, ultimately, God loves you. Nothing will separate you from his love. Step out in faith. The, oh, guys, we're, we're going to Nepal in September. By God's grace, Lord willing, we will. And um, I, I love to go serve people in other places. But can I tell you something? I'm the biggest chicken missionary ever. I'm a chicken missionary. We were on the phone with Barnabas, and Barnabas has planted 12 churches in 12 years, and just amazing. So he was saying, you know what? While you guys are there, 
could you and I do like a pastor's conference? And I'm thinking that that pastor's conference is going to be for the churches that he planted, right? So maybe 24 guys, whatever, just right in that. We're going to fly into Kathmandu. I'm thinking, okay, you know, I can, okay, Lord, I think I can get it to Kathmandu. Then Barnabas says, no. So once your team gets there, they're going to go trekking up and do witnessing up in the, in the, into the mountains and the villages and you and I are going to get on a domestic flight, he says. <laughs> and we're going to go to western, far western Nepal, where pastors hardly have any access to pastoral care. Well, part of me is going, oh, that's a great idea. What do you mean by a domestic flight? I mean, I start freaking out. I, you know, I just, I mean, I'm just telling you this. So what, what, would, what would it be? It's not courage. I, I'm just not a very courageous man in of, in of myself. The only way I can explain it to you is that I've been loved. I've been loved. And that love compels something in me. I, I don't think courageous people are just muscle-bound, you know, guys that just say, let's go to Western Nepal. You know, well, <laughs> I, I, th I think it's guys, men and women that have been affected by sovereign, intimate love. And it's love that gives courage. I, that's the only way I can explain it. Isn't that what overcomes fear? Isn't it love? You, somebody, you're afraid of somebody. What do you do? Just talk yourself into it? What overcomes fear is the love of God for you, but not just you. The goal of security is not just security. What overcomes fear, whether it's witnessing, whether it's parenting, whether it's staying in a troubled marriage, what overcomes fear is loving others. That's why God gives such a security to his people to make chicken guys like me willing to go places that I never would have thought going. It was co so cool. Just have a little pastor moment here. Um, <laughs> but you can listen in. A um, hundred pastors. A hundred pastors. I'm going, oh my goodness, Lord. That's amazing. Can we get John to go instead? <laughs> John is such a good preacher. And, you know, I mean, isn't it just so the thought though, Here's what gets to me at the end of the day. I'm thinking of these guys not having resources. I'm thinking uh, they're fighting the same battles we face. They're fighting the battles of insecurity. They're fighting battles of insufficiency. They're not feeling like they're doing as well as they'd like to do. They, they've got kids that get sick. And, and yet, do they have care given to them in the hard work of pastoring so what, what's going to get me on a domestic flight in Nepal? I'm, picking, I'm picturing crop duster, right? <laughs> you know, some of you are old enough. Remember Green Acres? There was a crop duster in Green Acres that has traumatized me somehow. <sighs> anyway, let's, let's get into this last section of, of the passage because it's, it's God's sovereign love for us that compels sacrificial love for others, and that's what I think you'll see in chapter 9. Uh, do you, like, dismiss at 1130? <sighs> I'm sorry, guys. Okay, here's the last point. Um, God's sovereign love compels our sacrificial love. Confidence in God's sovereign love and that security, right? in his power, in his goodness, even in the worst of suffering, empowers us to be witnesses for Christ. His security is meant to lead to sacrifice. And isn't that what Jesus did? That's when we look a lot like him. That's when the fragrance of our life, the aroma that comes out of our life, is so much like Jesus, even when it means risk and sacrifice. Security in God's sovereign love compelled Paul to have a heart to make even the greatest sacrifice for people. And remember who he's talking about here. When he says his brethren, the Jew, according to the flesh, these are the people who were chasing him from city to city. Remember through the book of Acts? Trying to ruin his reputation. If they couldn't ruin his reputation, they would stone him. They would beat him. 
And what did you notice what he says about them? He says, now this is wild because he's just gone in Romans 8 to talk about how nothing can separate him from the love of God and it has so affected his life. He knows nothing can separate him from the love of God, but he, it's so created a desire to live for the glory of the Lord, to advance God's name in the earth, that he says, I'm not lying. Remember he says, I'm not lying. If it were possible, and if it could help the unbelieving Jews to be saved, it's like he's saying, God, I love my family that's going, that, that none of them have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. God, I know only Jesus can die for this, but if it were possible, send me to hell. If that would, Lord, your love, your love is so life-changing. Your love has healed everything in me. And if it would help anything, I would be willing that I would be the cut-off one. I would be willing that I would be the accursed one. If it would mean that these people who hurt him so badly, that these people could know the joy that I have known in your grace and your sovereign, sovereign love. Do you see how I think it's been a tragedy that we disconnect that part of Romans 9 from Romans 8? That Romans 8 changes a person. It transforms us into the image of Christ. It makes us more than conquerors to be able to go into the face of adversity, relational adversity, and love and forgive and be patient and not give up on the hopeless ones. Oh, that's what God's sovereign love and security does for us. It blesses our hearts. It makes us more like Jesus which, of course, is where Paul got the idea, didn't he? Because there was one that was accursed. Wasn't there? There already was one. His name's Jesus. There was one that was cut off from God as our sin bearer. So there's no more need for another. Paul couldn't do it anyway, but there's no more need for someone else to do it, Paul. Jesus already did that. But here's what I'm getting at, guys. Do you see how deeply the love of Jesus was woven in to the heart of Paul? That he was so much thinking like his Savior that he would be willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice if it meant someone else could be saved. That just blows me away. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. 1 John 4, 10 and 11 says, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So I think Maybe in closing, I, I don't know if you want to, John, if you want to have the team come up, if I've already gone like way over time and people need to escape. <laughs> Jan sits in the front row sometimes. If I go too long, Jan starts mouthing, let my people go. <laughs> I love the little giggles. I love those little giggles. Now, you know, I don't think the place, though, to, to end this is the thought of you being willing to give the greatest sacrifice ever in your life. I'm really, really feeling in, like in our local church, I'm, I'm praying for our family of churches. If we're not experiencing the deep, deep love of Jesus, you, you might get guilted into getting on a crop duster in Nepal. But God doesn't want to guilt you into anything. He wants there to be a vibrant experience of his love going on in your heart that would step by step lead you into living sacrificially as his witness. And so it's, it, to, today it's almost like, where are you feeling insecure? And let's, why don't we just come before God and say, Lord, would you take the truth of Romans 8 
And would you make it my experience? I don't want to just know these verses in my head. By your spirit, would you make the love you speak of, the sovereign, intimate love, God, would you make it my experience again today? I, I, Lord, I, I am feeling insecure about my security. So God, here I am. Would you pour out your spirit upon me? Would you baptize me afresh in your love? Can I go and pray? Okay. Here we are, Lord. We're so glad to serve a God who doesn't just give us battle orders and just kind of command us around as though we were uh, just soldiers in an impersonal sort of war. You're just some sort of sterile general commanding people. We are so grateful that you are a father who loves us with the very same love that you love Jesus and God, Lord, wherever, wherever any brother or sister, whether a teenager, a, a, an eight-year-old today, God, Lord, all of us can, can lose sight of your love. We can worry, can kind of blind us from your love. Uh, trials can kind of distract us from your love. Lord, wherever someone is dry this morning, wherever someone's feeling vulnerable this morning, would you, by your spirit this morning, transform Romans 8 into a vibrant experience with the living God this morning? Please, God, we ask it for your glory. But we're, and, and Lord, we, we're not just asking it to make security the goal of security. We're asking it because there are people who need to know about this love. And we want to be sent people. But Lord, help us to receive from you again this morning so that we'll have something to share with those in need. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, God bless you. You know, I'm Arabic. I do this holy kissing thing that John hates. But um, So let me do this. I love you guys. Not sure.